This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. The Cambodian genocide took the lives of up to 3 million people between 1975 and 1979. Many were forced to work at labor camps where they faced abuse, torture, and starvation. But this is only part one of the story. The lesser known part is the story of Ghost Mountain, or Priya Vahir Mountain, where over 40,000 refugees were forced to climb to their death. Today, we hear from someone who experienced this firsthand. Bunsung Tang lives in Connecticut and is a survivor of this massacre. He joins us with his son, James Tang. Together, they produced a documentary film, Ghost Mountain, The Second Killing Fields. You can find the full documentary at ctpublic.org slash where we live. We started our conversation with Bung Sang and James by asking about what life was like in Cambodia before the genocide. Well, during what was called the golden years in Cambodia, Mm -hmm. uh, which people like himself who lived through that reminisce very fondly of Cambodia having sort of every modern thing that we had in the West there. They had music, they had, you know, movie theaters, watch Western movies. Um, But what was taking place at the borders was the Vietnam War. Um, And it began to spill through the rest of the region, particularly Cambodia. Um, Story goes is that the Viet Cong were sort of branching out um, and sort of setting up posts of um, of their provisions and military encampments outside of Vietnam in Cambodia. And they were using that as basis to go and attack the United States there. Um, so as a response um, to this, very secretly, the Nixon administration began to bomb Cambodia, which was uh, generally considered neutral. They had no stake in or they were trying to tell that line of, you know, we are not for the U.S., we're not for the Vietnamese, we're, we're the North Vietnamese, we are neutral here. Um, and I'm sure Nixon administration did not like that policy or felt like they may have been leaning towards some bias. So uh, they decided to secretly bomb the country. Um, and it started off as like bombing this border area, but it, if, if you look at other maps, they bombed the entire country itself. Um, And Cambodia became one of the most bombed countries in the 20th century. It was, we bombed Cambodia more than we bombed Japan in World War II. And there was enormous devastation that took place. And this all happened secretly. Um, Nobody knew about this. Um, Nobody heard about this until it it was really leaked out to a journalist who then uh, put in a Washington Post that, you know, we had been um, participating in this sort of operation there of indiscriminately dropping bombs over the country. And, and that eventually led to communist rule and purges. Can you give us an idea of what that looked like? Yeah, so this became very quickly um, a, a opportunity for what was a guerrilla fighting force, which is the Khmer Rouge, which means the Red, um, red Khmer's. And they're very much idealistic communists. Um, they weren't, before this bombing, they weren't favored at all. They were just some ragtag group, kind of people who were in the jungles um, and who wanted to sort of, they were outcasts in some ways. But once this bombing took place, they were able to convince a lot of the population and really play into um, the anger that was happening. It's like, you lost your family, you lost your worth, your, your livelihood, your fields and all of that. Um, you, you know, people had weddings and there was a bomb dropped on that. So they said, come and join us in our fight against these quote unquote American colonists. And um, at that time, the Lindo government who had, uh, who had deposed the prior leader, uh, the king, CNU, um, they said, these are representatives of the, or supporter backed by the Americans there. And so let's take over the country uh, and take back and um, establish reestablish, you know, um, our country from foreign influence there. In cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. This is not an invasion of Cambodia. Turn 
determined to be modern. When the country fell to the Khmer Rouge in 1975, its army purged the cities and committed atrocities on an unbelievable scale. When we were forced out of Phnom Penh, my father told me everything is going to be okay. And that's the last time I remember my father. Seven million people were forced into labor camps. That was a clip from the documentary Ghost Mountain. You can watch the full documentary on ctpublic.org slash where we live. Bun Zang, of course you were there when this was happening. Did you have any awareness what was what was happening before you reached the labor camps? Uh, well, we was live in uh, outside of Phnom Penh and... Uh, then the Civil War started in 1970, uh, uh, 69, 68. So, and um, so our family just left the village and uh, moved to close to the uh, Thai border. And um, so we, we was living uh, point by, uh, in the Thai border. So because of the Thai border, and we pretty much pretty peaceful because we don't have any, a, any fighting that much at all. Uh, so I didn't uh, know that much about uh, the war because where we live is pretty, pretty peaceful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you eventually ended up in a labor camp that's famously known as the Killing Field. Mm-hmm. Can you describe the kind of work that was being done there? Well, uh, <laughs> that's, that's also one of the worst things that uh, people can bear with. I mean... Uh, so every day they uh, put us to uh, dig the well. Uh, uh, they told us that uh, digging the well on the bottom of the mountain to, to collect water so they can grow, uh, they can grow uh, black pepper, you know. So, and I kind of was thinking, why, what the heck they are digging uh, the well on the bottom of the mountain with so much rock, you know. So they forced us to do a labor, hard labor every day, it's like, 13 or 14 hours a day without any foods, you know, without any, uh, uh, let us to go clean ourselves. And they just, just, they just treat us like animals every single day. Yeah. I'm there and I saw people are actually there before me and they are dying because uh, they cannot be with uh, uh, starvation and the tortures and they die. And they have no, uh, uh, Rule, they have no remorse to all those people at all. They don't care about how many people are dying, you know, because we, we dare to die anyway, so that's not, you know. That's, uh, during that time, we always think about that being being killed or being dying is better to live because it's so much torture and suffering, you know. So, but we, I mean, I try. I never try to fight for my survivor, and every day that we try, but... It's just like every day that we don't have any hope at all that we we made through the next day, yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, but we did make it to the next day, and we make it to the refugee camp, and that's one of the best day, the best place. And, and James, I want to, I definitely want to get into more of how the documentary came about. But you know, as you learn about this history, can you talk about how did what your father just described impact the population of Cambodia? Yeah, what was once about a population of 5 million before the this civil war and then this genocide that took place afterwards. Um, about as much as 2 million, a third of the country has been estimated to have lost their lives either through, you know, mass murder or the sickness or starvation. Um, and so it's been, um, as much as we hear, it's called the killing fields. Um, during that time, the only other comparison they could make was that this was the second Holocaust that had mm-hmm. just taken place. Um, and it shocked the whole world. And they couldn't believe when people were coming out and telling their stories that this was happening. Um, they, were, they were actually rejecting some of the, uh, the stories um, that were being told. And so the world had a hard time coming to grips that this had taken place to a really peaceful and gentle uh, country as Cambodia back then. Boon saying earlier, 
we talked a little bit about your experience in the labor camp, but you also ended up being at a refugee camp. Can you talk about what was that initially like? Well, after 1979, the Vietnamese invade to Cambodia, and I called that uh, liberated Cambodia. For me, I called it liberated for Cambodia because I was uh, tortured and, uh, you know, in a, in a refugee, I mean, in a concentrate camp. So for me to get out from there and right away, we escaped it to Thailand. And, uh, and when we get to Thailand and uh, one of the best that happened to my family because we are actually uh, uh, get away and, uh, from uh, starvation or being killed. Um, so, so one of the happy time that we have in the refugee camps because I've been separated with my family for almost four years uh, during, the, during the Khmer Rouge time. So, uh, so we reunited with my family and we escaped together and that, you know, so... So it's like one of the time that we all actually see each other, that we uh, we surrounded with barbed wire, but it's a great time that we've been <laughs> sharing the sad and the happy story together yeah, during that time. Yeah. And it's almost like a heaven for us because we feel like we are surrounded, uh, surrounded with people are protecting us. Can you talk about that day when buses actually started to show up and they were moving people to, uh, to another place. Yeah. Well, those happy times only last a month. And uh, my father and I said we are sharing a lot of happy things together, that we we thinking about what country we want to go on the third world country. Uh, but it turned out to be a month later, the Thai government secretly uh, sending the bus alongside a refugee camp early in the morning. And they, they, hold on, they held on to the microphone and they tell us to get on the buses. And uh, we kind of were uh, terrified that we already knew that they were send us back to Cambodia. And uh, because we heard a rumor a few days before that and we refused it to get on the bus. We don't want to get on the bus and uh, no matter what. And... Uh, and it's about 2,000 of us that we are human change uh, that we refuse to get on the bus. And, uh, and they come in and they beat us and they throw us and they push us on the bus. And uh, that's uh, what I described during that time. It's like we, uh, we, are, we are crying for help. I mean, is anybody that able to help us because, but it's just, we have nobody, just a refugee that very uh, vulnerable and uh, with the soldier have their gun and they just do whatever they want in the refugee camp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you eventually had to get on yes. one of those buses. Yes. Yeah. Did you have mm -hmm. any idea where you were going? We have no idea that we will be going. And I first I thought that they uh, just might to send us uh, back to Cambodia. And the refugee camp that we were staying in uh, called uh, Wat Kho, uh, at around Pate. So from the refugee camp to uh, a border is less than an hour drive, mm. a ride, you know. So, but somehow uh, they didn't send us to where we came from at the border. So they drove us 14 hours, and we was terrified that we don't know where they take us to. So we end up at the top of the mountain called Pravihir Mountain. Yeah. Instead of being processed as refugees, Bun Sun Tang and thousands of other refugees were forced on buses and driven to Pravihir Mountain, which is part of a mountain range between Thailand and Cambodia. As he describes... Refugees didn't know where they were going. But after experiencing the labor camps, they did not want to return to Cambodia. Returning to Cambodia was a devastating experience. Not only were they forced back into the country, but the mountain was filled with landmines, and refugees had no food or water. They were forced to climb down the mountainside, and those who didn't comply were gunned down. 
So we got there uh, early in the morning because it's fourteen hour bus ride, and we have we have no sleep, and we are tired. So as soon as we at the bus stop, and I I look out through the buses, and I was terrified and crying because I saw uh, the smoke come out from the ground and and first thing I see that oh that's how they go kill us mm. that's how they go bring us here and they gun us down and they shoot us and they burn us so we are so terrified to see everything surrounded before the bus stop is like and my family are waking in the bus and say this is our last that's the last stop that they go kill us because they're surrounded with, uh, with jungle. And um, so the, when the bus stopped, the soldier came and uh, knocked to the bus and told us to get out the buses. And, uh, and I didn't know that I'm on, on top of the mountain. Mm-hmm. I have no, no clues. And they, we asked them, uh, where are we going? And they point us, where are we going? So, and there's so many people. I mean, there's thousands of people, young and old and handicapped, and people are sick, people are pregnant, and, and we are moving slow. And especially my father, he was old. I, I'm, I'm holding on to him. And so because we move so slow, and the Thai soldier and get so angry, and first they find they fire the gun up to the air. They say, "Move fast and move fast, move fast," and and then and we we had no way to go. We have no no knowing where they sent us to, and they point us. That's what you are going. And and I didn't realize until they point down to to where we're going. I look down. I say, I say, "Oh my God, we are on top of the mountain," you know, and. Uh, Sooner or later, they just gun people, and because we are moving too slow, so we just we just keep going down, and uh, the mountain is so is so steep, and we have to hold on to the wire, and clip by clip we just get down, and so many people died there. Today, we're hearing from the documentary filmmakers Bunsen Tang and James Tang, who produced a film, Ghost Mountain, The Second Killing Fields. Watch the full documentary on ctpublic.org slash where we live. Coming up, we hear about returning to Priyavahir Mountain nearly 40 years after these atrocities occurred. From Connecticut Public Radio, this is Where We Live. I'm Catherine Shen. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Today, we're hearing from documentary filmmakers Bunsen Tang and James Tang, who produced the film Ghost Mountain, The Second Killing Fields. You can find the full documentary at ctpublic.org slash where we live. We just heard Bunsen Tang describe his experience on Priya Vahir Mountain. He was among thousands of Cambodia refugees that were forced down the mountainside at gunpoint. The mountain was filled with landmines and refugees had no food or water. Those who didn't comply were shot and killed. Nearly 40 years later, while making the documentary, Ban Seng returned to this site. He describes this incredibly emotional day. After 38 years later, and uh, my son and I uh, wanted to do a documentary, so uh, so we went to uh, that mountain size, and uh, it's the first thing that I remember what happened 38 years before, and uh, and the place is on change. I mean, uh, and the soldier that patrolled the border told us that all this year is n- no human. No human that actually allowed to come here because the landmine is still there and nobody cleaned out the landmines at all. And uh, so we told them that we come here to uh, uh, 
do the documentary uh, what happened 38 years ago and the soldier told us they know exactly what's going on and uh, that's what they call that's what they call the mountain uh, a ghost mountain because before it's a different name because so many people lost their lives so now the name is changed yeah so they they told us it's too dangerous to go in there because they not allow us to 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 go in there and uh, and we told them that we come here to do a documentary and nothing to do with politics in at all you know, politi- political you know so mm-hmm. and uh, and and they say wow well, we we can let you go and uh, finally they they say well we we let you go but you 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 in your own race mm-hmm. yeah yeah so i'm very emotional when i get in there and i um see all the things that we left behind i mean uh the memory is back and i lost uh i lost my brother in law there and i also my father make it to halfway and he passed away and everything's coming back so yeah, yeah, yeah. in the documentary bon sang and james visit private here mountain here's a clip where they return to the site of the massacre almost four decades later i accompany my father and my uncle to visit what remains at the site of the Pravi here massacre. It's very difficult to walk through here. We follow the track that everybody went on the top of the mountain that Thai soldiers told us that whatever we have water money goals water boat just give it to them. And they say you're not gonna need it down there. Uh, just drop it in the bucket and give it to them. As you can see, the cliff is so steep down, and they keep gunning us down. We have no way to get down. We have to hold, hold the wire to, get, to lower ourselves down. Clip by clip. We heard the planes, the sound of planes flying through. We thought someone come to help us. 43,000 refugees cry out. <laughs> For help. But no one come for us. You can find the full documentary on ctpublic.org slash where we live. James, was it, what was it like for you being there? It was uh, quite incredible. And um, leading up to it, it was a little nerve-wracking because I had been there just about three years prior. Not in that particular era, but I had been told that these remains and all of these clothes and all of the things the refugees left behind were still there. Um, so I come back a few years later with a camera crew this time, and I don't know what to expect when we go in there. Uh, I don't even know if I'm leading my crew into the right place. Mm. So there's this, this sense of like huge uncertainty. It's, it feels a little perilous. Um, and when we actually go in there to film, I'm just struck by how much what I'm seeing um, matches what my father has been saying mm. all these years of me documenting him. And it's as if I was actually living through history itself. Um, and I could not believe like they would take us there and they would just start pulling out the ground. Just the artifacts, the clothes, the blankets, the pots and pans that all these refugees left behind. Uh, and I was just shocked. I was like, this is really true. This really happened. I was quite stunned and like nobody's seen this ever there. And I felt like we were breaking new ground in that then. So, James, I want to ask you to, you know, can you talk about why hasn't this story been told yet? Yeah, it's a good question. Pravi here, um, the pushback of these refugees in Pravi here, uh, at the time, um, there were many rescue workers who were trying to raise awareness about it. And um, they did, there's a New York Times article that was written by Henry Cam. They tried to... um, bring more of the press. Um, I think it was even efforts to get to the Pope in Rome um, to know about this incident because you have 40,000 refugees who were just sent 
on a mountainside with in a minefield there. Um, what eventually happened was that um, a lot of these refugees ended up um, being saved um, through negotiations with Thailand. Um, and uh, a lot of them were resettled quickly. And so uh, the matter was resolved uh, in a way um, um, that was done through diplomacy. Now, when asked later on, like, why did you do this and the line of questioning, and a lot of the, the Thai uh, counterparts that the relief workers worked with didn't want to answer and they felt very embarrassed. And it seemed like this kind of operation was done by the military, a, a rogue set of the military leaders there that did that. Um, and they did not, the rescue workers did not want to press in more and raise more issues because they were guests of the country there. And their primary role, role was to help as many refugees as possible. Um, so it was about moving on and not stirring enough and more trouble. Uh, and, and that would lead to them getting ousted there. Um, going further, it's also... Um, this, this story, it's, it falls on the backdrop of the Cambodian killing fields. And there was just so much out there about the Cambodian kill fields. And this kind of got put in the back burner of that. Um, and then a lot of Cambodians, like my father, who came to this country uh, at large, they all just decided just to put it, put it aside there. Um, and this was just, this is so common um, there. Um, and so that's here in Hence why we have this story. I think also locationally, um, placing refugees in this remote part of the country, um, there are very few people to see and witness and document that there. Unlike the killing fields where all the journalists were kind of able to get into Cambodia and see that. Um, and so it wasn't until us where we came in and went there with the camera crew, we were just barely the first people who actually set foot in there. And I don't know, with with a camera uh, and you know, so many years there. I do want to get into the documentary a little bit because I think there's there's an informational and educational aspect to it. You know, do you think there is need for more education about the Cambodian genocide? Yeah, I think it's it plays a lot into the timeliness of like where we are in the world today. I think we have um, a lot of the policies and foreign policy we've had since the 70s are still the things we do in the world generally. Um, and so how do we resolve war and conflict um, is a major question we have. And I think what happened in Cambodia, this killing fields, is tells two stories. There's one story where we tried to resolve it using by, you know, bombing those who were not part of the war, you know, using that as our tactical operation. And uh, that led to really poor results there. Um, there's another side of it too. Uh, we lost the war in Vietnam and there were other people who were part of the State Department, part of government, NGOs as well, who said the opposite. Uh, we left this problem, there's consequences, and it, it's up to us to make up for it. And they stayed behind and began providing human assistance uh, relief work. And uh, I personally believe this story really echoes that history of like further devastation was averted because um, it was sweeping through that whole region. And it kept, you know, the thai Cambodia border and Thailand itself from potentially becoming a bigger problem there. Um, so I think like going forward, like we should take this as both American history, something that is a legacy that was laid. Um, providing relief and humanitarian assistance, and also like as good lessons learned, like how do we, how do we use this in our world today too? I think this story, particularly um, at Pravi here, which is itself um, a very untold story. Um, you have the Cambodian genocide, which was well documented. Um, you know, you had a movie that was made of it called The Killing Fields in 1984, um, and. It, it seems like this second ordeal, um, which my father and many 40,000 other refugees went through, um, they've described as like being worse than what they experienced in these three and a half years under this really brutal and cruel genocide regime. It was way worse than that. Uh, this story has been really buried and uh, overlooked there. Um, 
And so I, I, th- I think this story is quite important for Cambodia um, to really preserve. Um, I think it's important, like, for as like a human case, humanitarian case study as well. Um, there, but particularly for Cambodia, um, the the story is both uh, incredible and in the sheer like um, magnitude of what happened to refugees and what. Uh, these people who, you know, innocently went through one devastation and up in another and lost their lives there. Um, but it also sets place in a very uh, key part of Cambodia. One of the reasons it was that area had so many landmines was because it was set next to a very important and most sacred temple in Cambodia called Pravihir Temple. And so those landmines were there to buffer and protect that, that kind of temple area. Um, and I say that because it, it, today, people, um, that, that temple, Pravihir Temple, is considered Cambodia's second uh, world heritage site after Angkor Wat. Mm-hmm. So there's more and more tourists going to this place. It's beautiful. It sits on top of 2,000 feet above. Uh, and it was the most sacred relic in Cambodian history. And people will visit that, but they don't know that a mere two miles is where this whole devastation and this tragedy of where my father was placed there. Um, and so I think, you know, telling both stories is both telling, um, both the, uh, the pride and the admiration of Cambodia's past. And then you also have like the profane, just like the horror that had taken place just on the shadows of it all. Um, and I think having these two in constant is, is something that Cambodians would do right by, you know, uh, preserving for themselves there. And and to have the story be such a huge part of your family's history, you know, is this something that has also become a part of your identity? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that um, growing up, I was pretty much very uh, American as a as a kid. Um, I think our families, uh, their relationship with their past was kind of similar too. It was when they came to this country, let's forget about uh, the past, let's move on. Uh, let's just do work, have meaningful lives, put our families to school. And so that's what we live with. Um, we may sometimes knew, have known like they went through something because they made remarks here and there, primarily through disciplining us. Like you should eat all that food because, you know, we starve for just a golf ball size portion mm-hmm. each day. Um, but that was it. It was kept at a distance there. And, you know, I came of age when I wanted to know more and seek more about the story. And as I sat down with my father and Lamar, I realized like, um, wow, this is, this is really how, this is really who my family is. Um, this is, this, it brought so much understanding um, there. And um, I think I myself has been able to say like, I am, you know, Khmer American. Um, more, and affirm that more so. And because it tells this like incredible story, uh, and it's able to point all these dots backwards. And Bun saying, what went through your mind when James was like, tell me, tell me your story, dad. <laughs> tell me your story. <laughs> well, um, when I first arrived in this country, I always want to tell the story. Mm-hmm. And I say one day I want to tell the whole world what happened to uh, millions and thousands of people that lost their life. And uh, so, and I keep telling story all this year, and I'm looking for somebody to help me to do the story. And one day, my son, he uh, actually just started college, and he came to me and he said, Pa, I can help you to do the story. And I kind of look at him, I say, no, not you, <laughs> because... Uh, uh, you 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 don't understand how I lived through because you was born in this country. You born with a, a silver spoon in your mouth. So uh, you complain uh, uh, colored mattress is too firm for you. And I was sleeping on the ground for four years. I say you have no relation to what I lived through. So no way. <laughs> <laughs> what a dad thing to do. <laughs> so. Uh, but James keep coming and say, Pa, I, I can help you. And I I was uh, just say, okay, one day he will give up. So I keep telling his story. And uh, and he, he keep 
assist to go on. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't realize that uh, telling the story is so difficult mm-hmm. and I had to relive again. And uh, my nightmares start coming back. And I told Jim, I say, I, I can't, I can't continue go on and doing this because uh, uh, the nightmare is just terrible. And um, so Jim keeps saying that, well, we're doing slow, we, we're doing slow, and we take a break and we continue again, you know. So, and um, so I'm very thankful that actually Jim able to keep going and uh, get the story told today. Yeah. Well, it sounds like James inherited some of his dad's stubbornness, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I mean, we're grateful for that. So because now that we now we're more aware mm. of the history mm. that happened there. And and with that, I, I want to ask both of you just some final thoughts for our listeners who are listening. You know, what do you hope they take from this conversation today? When I primarily started this story, it was telling one of... Um, you know, inspirational that my father was a survivor. Um, and knowing that he was a survivor got me through some difficult lumps in my life too. And um, he went through something that, you know, one in a billion odds. And so, uh, and it's through that sheer human perseverance there. And what I want to share is that, you know, everyone can get through whatever, uh, triumph over what confronts them there, as long as they have the hope and faith that they can get through it. Um, and the last part is, you know, we have a history of both um, having been involved in this, but a history of compassion, um, helping, you know, provide assistance there. And that's not really, there's a lot of unsung heroes out there. And so um, this film, this documentary is a tribute to all of those. My father is here because he was rescued by many mm-hmm. there. And we did a lot of good things too. And I think that's something that ought to be shared more broadly. And Ben saying, what do you hope our listeners will take out from this conversation today? Well, it's the same thing that I have uh, mentioned before, and uh, be kind to one another, and uh, be empathetic to the people that actually need it. If you can help them, uh, do the best you can, and but please don't hurt the people that really vulnerable that uh, need help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You just heard from Bunsen Tang and James Tang, who are both featured in this documentary. And you can find a link to this documentary on our website, ctpublic.org slash where we live. Coming up next, we talk about how some teachers are working to bring this film to their classrooms. From Connecticut Public Radio, this is Where We Live. I'm Catherine Shen. Stay with us. <laughs> I'm Catherine Shen. We just heard from James Tang and Bunsen Tang, who produced and were featured in the documentary Ghost Mountain, The Second Killing Fields. James and Bunsen want to bring attention to the atrocities of the Cambodian genocide, and one local educator wants to bring their documentary into Connecticut schools. Joining us now is Jenny Hekila Diaz. They are a professional learning coordinator for the Connecticut Council for the Social Studies and also the activist in residence for UConn Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. They are also the co-chair of the Asian Pacific American Coalition of Connecticut. JHD, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. And so, you know, we've talked about this documentary, Ghost Mountain, which you've also seen. Can you tell me what went through your mind when you first watched it? I actually first got to see the documentary almost a year ago now. Um, I got to watch it with 100 high school students in New Haven. And um, it was it was a really like life changing experience, um, especially to experience it with so many young people and to get to speak with one of the co-creators, James, and his father, Bunsang, that day. It was it was a pretty overwhelming experience. And what was it like sharing that experience with students? I think all of us shared this moment, like this kind of long moment of silence afterwards, because even though it's only about 45 minutes long, it's such an amazing story in so many ways and so heartbreaking. And to know so little to nothing about it, I think that was also 
part of the experience to have so many people in a room realize this this thing had happened and we didn't really know anything about it before. Right. Seeing that film was, it was a lot. Right. We felt very similar in the sense of like it, like you mentioned, it's it's a it's a pretty short film in comparison to other documentaries, but we definitely felt that punch. You know, what has it been like using this as a as a teaching tool in classrooms and how are students responding to it? Their their reception of the film is incredible. It's it shows how even if the storyline is unlike any that they've ever experienced before, that the documentary is so well made. Um, and even though the students walk away with, a, honestly, a billion questions about, you know, backdrop, what happened before this, what happened after this, um, it shows that it's it's created this incredible dialogue among students. And then also with the creators, with James and Bunsang, like there's this one teacher I've been working with. He showed the film in late April and then um, Bunsang and James went into his classroom and talked to the students, um, you know, to fill in some gaps and then also take what questions they have. And there's been this on lo- ongoing email thread since then, so for over about a month now, where um, the teacher and the students talk, collect questions, send them to James, and then James and his father spend some time answering the questions. So they've had this ongoing um, conversation, and that that's really been fueled by more and more questions that students have. Um, so it just shows the that even though again it's it's such a short documentary, it has. Um, incredible power in terms of having students really, really engage with history and think about it in the context of our current, our current day. I, I think that interesting, the interesting thing about using this documentary is that um, each teacher, so most of the teachers who showed it are modern world history teachers. Um, and as I said, in New Haven, they're, they're already teaching, um, they're already teaching about genocide as part of their course. Um, so fortunately for the New Haven teachers, they, they've they already built some context and they've already um, built some, some backdrop and understandings for students. And even still with that, um, watching this documentary, um, the students will ask some really like basic questions. Like some of them got really, they wanted to ask a lot of questions about the skulls and how there are so many skulls in the film. And it seems like, it's like they're being obsessive about a strange thing, but it actually leads to, um, led to even more questions that really helped the students understand the scale of what happened, that so many people um, were killed. Addressing even those, those questions that seem like they're sort of stuck in like literal comprehension of the film um, helps, to, helps to have the students um, have those deeper conversations as they as they continue to unpack what they're watching and then connecting it because the students automatically do it. You don't even need to prompt them. They connect it to other things going on in the world that they know about, whether it's from their family's history or what's going on right now in our world. With that in mind, you know, however the students make connections and, and how they learn and the questions that they ask. You know, when we're teaching history, I think learning about the Holocaust is usually a big part of the world history curriculum. But can you talk about, is there a need to broaden that discussion when it comes to education about genocide? I think so. I mean, I, I think there are, there have been so many, um, so many moments in history where we've had incredible, incredible numbers of people killed. Um, and that's not because I want us to only learn about all the atrocities. Right. Um, and at the same time, going back to what I said before, if we, if we try to hide the atrocities, um, you know, going back to genocide um, and in some cases, continual genocide in our country of some of our communities here, um, then we're really not helping our our communities come together to be a community together um, because we're ignoring or pretending um, that that we've we've experienced these things and that certain parts of our community in particular have been incredibly harmed in ongoing fashion um, by these atrocities. 
And, you know, as these conversations continue and as, as the students are, are, are learning about history, I think from a different lens compared to when I was in the classroom, you know, do you see a call to action in this film? You know, what, what takeaways do you hope that the students walk away with? This, this is a hard question for me because I, you know, in, in social studies education, we, you know, we definitely want students to be informed and we want them to take action. And um, while I have, you know, some things that I would like to see happen in the world, I also try not to be too prescriptive in what I hope that students walk away with. Like that's sure. part of the reason why um, some of the planning around this has been a uh, typical sort of inquiry open-ended mm. um, because we, we want, we want the students to, to critically, to critically look at these, these different um, pieces of history um, and see how they're interconnected and think about, you know, what are the things that we should keep doing um, in our society? What are the things that we should stop doing in our society? And which, what are the things we should start doing? Um, I guess if I had to say one thing that I would hope is that um, I would hope that our young people see these things and um, and they want to start doing some things that maybe we have not been doing so well, um, especially speaking of older generations, um, including making sure that uh, these these types of stories that have been purposefully hidden are not hidden. Um, I think that's one of the really beautiful things about Ghost Mountain is that it's actually a, like a family effort, right, to tell a really important local, national, and international story is that it's a son and father. Um, and I know there are other people on the team, but the fact that they're both a part of telling this story um, it is it makes it really meaningful and shows the power of really knowing um, your family story and how that affects you to this day. Thank you to Jenny Hakila Diaz for joining us today. They're a professional learning coordinator with the Connecticut Council for the Social Studies and also the activist in residence for UConn's Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Tess Terrible. Our technical producer is Dylan Reyes. Download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening. Now me and father did.